Good morning, everybody. My name is Connor Flanagan. I'm the assistant director here at the Southampton History Museum. This morning, we're joined by author and historian Bill Blyer. Uh, he was a staff writer for Newsday for over 33 years, and his new book, The Sinking of the Steamboat, like, uh, sorry, The Sinking of the Steamboat Lexington on the Long Island Sound is officially published as of Monday, May 1st, and it's on sale pretty much anywhere you can get a book, local bookstores here on Long Island, on Amazon, anything like that. If you want to get a signed copy, you can communicate that with Bill, um, and we'll have his email and information available for everybody to do so. So without any further ado, we're going to pass everything over to Bill, and we'll get started on today's talk. If you have any other questions or comments, please feel free to submit those in the Q&A or the chat function below. Thanks. Well, thank you, Connor. So um, on a bitterly cold afternoon of Monday, January 13th, 1840, approximately up to 150 men, women, and children uh, were on board a steamboat leaving Manhattan uh, for Stonington, Connecticut. Uh, the vessel never made it. Only four of the passengers and crew survive. Uh, it was the most, it was and remains the worst maritime disaster in the history of Nassau and Suffolk County. Uh, and the steamboat was named the Lexington. The, uh, the wreck was uh, a major event of the time. It was sort of the Titanic of the 1840s, got huge public attention and outrage and outcry, uh, lots of media attention around the country and beyond. Uh, but today, most people don't know about it at all. Uh, it, part of that was it was surpassed in death toll by accidents like the General Slocum on East River in 1904 that killed more than a thousand people and then the Titanic in 1912. And uh, basically very few people today know about the Lexington and they fall into sort of three categories. Uh, one is maritime historians and not all of them know about it. It took me until 1995 writing a story about shipwrecks uh, for Newsday to stumble across uh, my first reference to the Lexington. Uh, there's also scuba divers, you know, the more experienced divers out there who don't mind bad visibility and strong currents. Uh, some of them have uh, gone deep to visit the Lexington off of Port Jefferson. Uh, and probably the main group of people that know anything about the Lexington are people that are familiar with lithography and collect current Ives images because the one you see here was done uh, for the New York Sun by Nathaniel Currier before he took on Ives as his partner uh, and it made him world famous. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too. So uh, early days of steamboating on Long Island Sound begins in 1815, a captain named L.U. Bunker, who later becomes a steamboat inspector who actually inspects the Lexington before its last voyage, uh, takes a steamboat uh, one year after the first successful trial of steamboats uh, by the Fulton on uh, the Hudson River, uh, goes through the rocks and currents of Hellgate and proves you can get a, a, a steamboat out of New York Sound and add on to Long Island Sound. Um, he takes him 11 hours to go 75 miles to New Haven, but this opens a, uh, a new era, era of transportation where people can go by boat to New England. And pretty much anybody traveling on the sound at this point is trying to get from New York to Boston or Boston to New York. Very little interest in going to ports in New England in between or anywhere in Long Island. So um, it gets a, a very growing business. A lot of entrepreneurs get into it, city fathers in different cities in New Haven. Uh, New London, Providence, and Stonington get into it because uh, the early way to go on that route was a three-day bumpy st stagecoach ride, or you could try to take a sailing vessel, but because of, because of the wind and the current and the weather, uh, you, it could take a long time to do that trip. So what happens is they, uh, the technology and the finances is not available to build railroad from north from New York because there's too many rivers, too many big hills. Um, but they can build railroads southwest from Boston, and they start to do that. So the railroads are stretching down to New London, Providence, down to Stonington, New Haven. Uh, and then the steamboats are coming from New York to rendezvous in the middle of the night with those train lines. So people can now make the trip from, uh, either way in, in, within a day rather than three days. So um, uh, all of this activity uh, generates interest in an entrepreneur uh, in, I don't know if my is not going to work here, but uh, Stonington is sort of all the way up in the upper uh, right corner, uh, and uh, New York obviously is down in the lower side. So uh, all the steamboat interest attracts uh, a gentleman named Cornelius Vanderbilt, shown here in sort of early middle age. Uh, but he grows up on Staten Island, gets involved in water businesses, uh, is a teenager, 
Uh, he's ferrying people on a sloop from Staten Island uh, to New, New York and back and, and along with cargo. Uh, he thinks steamboats initially are a fad that'll pass, but eventually he sees so much activity uh, in New York Harbor and on the Hudson River that he starts to work for a steamboat company uh, on New York Harbor, uh, travels up the Hudson, uh, paying close attention to the technology. Uh, it starts to uh, invest in steamboats and then eventually uh, at age 35 and 1829, he starts his own steamboat line. And um, he's running on the Hudson and he's a brilliant marketer and cost cutter, uh, always engages in pr great promotions, but also in fair wars that uh, basically drive his competitors to the brink of bankruptcy. So he's running on the Hudson with uh, basically one boat, but the competitors who have much bigger boats can't keep up with him because he keeps dropping his fares. So eventually in uh, 1834, they offer him thousands of dollars to basically get off the river, uh, which he does. And then he decides to invest that money in building a next generation steamboat to operate on the growing market out on Long Island Sound. So what he does is uh, designs his own steamboats back when there's no blueprints. So what you would do is carve a side view model called a half model and bring it to a shipyard. So he does that. Um, uh, what he decides to build is not unlike any other steamboat ever built uh, before or after. Uh, he finds a book of plans for building bridges, and in that he sees a plan for a bridge with a sort of arch deckway supported not by heavy timbers, but by uh, like a box, box worth, box like lattice work kind of structure. Uh, and he says, let me try this on a steamboat. And the result of that is a hull that's very strong. Uh, probably stronger than the typical uh, heavy ribs and planking construction, but it's also very light, which means the steamboat will burn less fuel and go faster. So he takes his design uh, for what becomes the Lexington to a shipyard co-owned by his nephew, Jeremiah Simonson, down in lower Manhattan, and says, build me this boat, spare no expense. I want it to be the fastest, safest, and most luxurious boat on Long Island Sound. Um, and uh, they describe it as being, quote, very peculiar, uh, but they go ahead and build it. And it it does become everything Vanderbilt wants at a great price of about $75,000, which is $2.5 million in today's money, which is more than uh, a typical steamboat of this 205-foot length would cost. Uh, but there's a lot of innovation even besides the, uh, the lattice work construction. Uh, Vanderbilt has studied steamboats, and they typically have two steam engines, two, two boiler furnaces, powering two paddle wheels. And Vanderbilt decides that if he could build a much bigger steam engine, about 50% bigger, uh, instead of two smaller ones, he would get better fuel efficiency and then could power larger paddle wheels. So the, the Lexington has 24 foot diameter paddle wheels, 50% uh, bigger than typical steamboat and uh, this one large steam engine. Uh, and that's built up in the West Point foundry across the, the Hudson River from West Point. Uh, this is what it would look like a little bit later, uh, in the late 1800s. Uh, and here's a, a famous painting showing what the inside of that foundry would have looked like. So the Lexington is uh, covered by the Steamboat Safety Act of 1838, which requires three lifeboats, uh, which turns out to be only a third of the capacity of the people on board. And that actually, that, that law stays in effect until the Titanic sinks in 1912 with uh, inadequate lifeboats for its passengers and crew. Uh, it's required to have a quote unquote fire engine, which is a small portable steam pump uh, that, with a hose that they can uh, shoot water on a fire. And um, it also has um, about 20 fire buckets they can use to dip into the sound and throw water on, on a fire. So the Lexington um, is launched uh, June 1st, 1835, uh, uh, sorry, launched uh, in the spring and then goes into service June 1st, 1835, covers the first trip to Providence, Rhode Island in 210 miles at an average speed of 17 miles an hour, which is about a third faster than other boats. So they make the trip in 12 hours instead of the normal 18, which allows them to connect with trains that much sooner. Uh, this is hailed by the, by the public and the newspapers of the time. The uh, Journal of Commerce in New York writes a big banner headline saying fastest boat in the world. And then the story says her construction exhibits a particularly bold and independent genius. 
So the, the Lexington is a huge success from day one. People flock to it because of its amenities, because uh, it's very luxurious, good food, uh, but particularly because of the speed. They want to get to New England or back from New England as quick as possible. So uh, here's one of the ads, Vanderbilt uh, places. He calls his line the people's line because he says he's doing all this great service to make uh, uh, trips affordable for the general public and not just rich people. Uh, and uh, it's basically sailing between Providence or Stonington every other day and then returning the, in the, on the opposite days. Uh, and if you look on top here, you can see the fare from Newport uh, is four dollars and fifty cents. When he launches the boat, the typical fare that his competitors are charging is eight dollars one way. Uh, Vanderbilt immediately gets into a fare war uh, because his costs are lower with his one large steam engine. So at this point, when they say at least down to four fifty. They'll keep dropping the price. The New Jersey Steam Transportation Company, which runs most of the boats out on the Sound, will match his rate, and then he'll drop it again. Eventually, he gets down to zero, uh, but he still makes money because, like Spirit Airlines, he's charging for every amenity. So if you want to ride inside the cabin rather than on deck, it's an extra 50 cents. Uh, if you want to eat, it's more money. If you want to have a bunk along the side of the main salon, that's more money. Uh, so his competitors can't basically keep up with him and he's driving them out of business. Uh, he runs the boat this way for three years and then approaches his competitors and said, if you will buy the Lexington for $60,000, I will leave the, the uh, Long Island Sound route to you. Uh, the company doesn't quite believe him, uh, but they decide to take a chance and buy the Lexington uh, because it's still a very popular boat, very successful, and they primarily want to get Vanderbilt out of their hair. Uh, so they buy the Lexington in 1839, uh, 1838, 1839, and uh, uh, he goes away for a while, but then will come back. Uh, the company spends $12,000 to overhaul the Lexington, primarily to put uh, to change the steam engines to burn coal rather than wood, because coal burns hotter, which means they can go faster and would also, would also be cheaper for them. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> part of the deal, which is interesting, is this is Jacob Vanderbilt uh, in middle age, Cornelius's younger brother. Uh, he has been the captain uh, of the Lexington for his brother, uh, and he's known as a ruthless competitor. He will do whatever he can to get into harbor quicker than his, uh, his competing captains, including ramming their steamboats if necessary to get them out of the way. Uh, because of his reputation, people want to want to ride on a boat that he pilots because they want to get to, into their destination quicker. So part of the deal is that he will continue to run the Lexington for the new owners, even though uh, his brother no longer owns the boat. So this is where we're at on January 14th, 1840. Uh, new York is experiencing one of the coldest winters in history. Uh, when they leave at 4 p.m., which is the typical departure time for the steamboats, it's four degrees in Manhattan. And by the middle of that night uh, out on Long Island, it'll be recorded as 19 below. Uh, and this plays an important role in what happens next. So you have a crew of about 135. The passengers uh, bring it up to a total of a, up to 150. And uh, there's a lot of miscellaneous cargo, but the primary cargo is 150 bales of tightly compacted cargo, uh, cotton, uh, which will become uh, important later and controversial as well. So uh, the, uh, when they get ready to leave, uh, Jake Vanderbilt uh, has a head cold and he uh, tells the owners of the company that he's gonna stay in bed that day. So they assign a backup captain named George Child. Uh, here's a nice mini portrait of him. So the passengers come primarily from Providence, which is the, the home base of most of the crew. And, uh, and the, the Lexington was supposed to sail on Tuesday night, but because of the ice built up, in the East River on the Sound, they decide to run the Lexington a day early uh, because it's the strongest boat in their fleet because of the way it was constructed. Uh, that means that most of the crew is out of position out in Providence or somewhere in Stonington uh, and can't make the trip. So they have to fill in with other other employees, uh, other captains, uh, other captain, other crew from, from their, their roster of employees. Uh, so uh, a lot of people from New York, uh, but there's people from uh, Midwest, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New Orleans, and even a, a father and son from uh, England. Uh, a couple of interesting people on board. This is Charles Fallon, who's a German literature professor at Harvard. 
uh, who's also the minister of a new congregation in Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, when he was growing up in, in, in Germany, he studied architecture as well. So he has designed a new church for his congregation, which was just completed. He's on his way from New York to Boston to go for the dedication of the church, but he won't make it. Uh, there's also two, uh, at least at the time, famous comedy actors from Boston, Charles Eberly and Henry Finn, who are celebrities then, but unheard of today. There's a young woman named Mary Russell who was married in New York the day before. Uh, her parents and relatives don't know about it, so uh, she's traveling alone uh, on the Lexington to, to go see her relatives and tell her that she's a bride, but she'll only be a bride for one day. Uh, there's a woman named Alice Winslow, whose husband has just died, so she's traveling with three male relatives to bring his body back to New England for burial. Uh, there's also four ship captains from ocean-going vessels on board traveling as passengers because they're going home to visit friends and family between voyages. One of them is a 24-year-old captain named Chester Hillard, uh, who will be a major player in what follows. So they leave New York at 4 p.m. They get uh, through the ice on the East River, get out into the Sound. And about 6 p.m., they serve dinner off of Sands Point area, north of Port Washington. Uh, the boat is full, so they have to do two set, two servings, two seatings. Uh, you would have, would have had a choice of mutton with boiled tomatoes or baked flounder with wine sauce and rice. Uh, everybody's eaten by around seven o'clock and people are starting to turn in uh, if they have a bunk uh, behind a curtain along the side of the cabin. Uh, the Lexington, uh, as part of its crew, has a full-time pilot who's in charge of navigation. So he would spend the entire voyage up in the wheelhouse, either steering himself or supervising another helmsman. So about 7.30 p.m., uh, a crewman rushes into the pilot house and grabs Manchester. Uh, he's one of the four survivors. He testifies a week after the accident uh, at an inquest in New York. Uh, and this is what he testified. He said, someone came to the wheelhouse door and told me the boat was on fire. My first movement was to step out of the wheelhouse and look aft. So the upper deck burning all around the smoke pipe. Um, at, that, at that moment, the captain runs into the wheelhouse and the three of them the helmsman child in Manchester sort of grabbed the steering wheel and instinctively try to turn the boat to the right because they, they're uh, four miles north of Eaton's Neck uh, near Huntington. And they realize that a boat on fire that that's badly already is basically doomed. Uh, and they want to try to get it to the beach so people can be rescued or, or escape the fire. Uh, there's a couple of problems. The Lexington, like the other steamboats of the year, is steered by a wheel connected to a rudder at the stern uh, and running down under the top deck is a series of metal rods to connect them. But they need a flexible connection at the rudder and at the steering wheel, and they have rawhide ropes to do that, which is typical. Uh, as they're turning the steering wheel, uh, uh, picking up his testimony, he said, uh, we had not yet headed to the land when something gave way, which I believe was the tiller rope. So what had happened is the fire had burned up under the promenade deck beneath the warehouse and burned through those rawhide ropes. So when they turned the wheel, nothing happened. Uh, to make matters worse, the fire has already driven the engineering crew away from the steam engines and they can't release the steam pressure. So the Lexington is continuing northwest away from Long Island, I'm sorry, northeast away from Long Island uh, at, at its cruising speed of 13 miles an hour with no way to stop it. Uh, it takes about 20 minutes for the steam to dissipate on its own. And meanwhile, the boat is forging ahead. So uh, they, they, uh, Manchester goes down on the foredeck uh, to get the portable fire engine running, which they do. Uh, a fireman named Charles Smith, who survives, uh, grabs the hose, which is running down the deck and realizes the hose is running right into the fire and is burning. So the steam engine won't do them any good. Uh, other crew under the direction of second mate David Crowley grab the fire buckets that haven't already been burned up by the flames and start throwing water uh, on the fire and on the deck to keep it from burning their feet uh, up on the bow. Uh, the crew would know uh, from their maritime experience that launching the three lifeboats uh, while the boat is still forging ahead is, is going to be not very easy, uh, but they realize the boat is burning so quickly that they have no choice. So child goes back to the paddle wheel area and they try to launch the two lifeboats. Uh, they put people in them, they start to lower them. 
somebody cuts the block and tackle uh, on the bow of one boat where a child is standing and the bow drops into the water while the back of the boat is still up on the deck. Uh, so everybody's dumped out and the boat drops into the water and is lost. Uh, they try the second lifeboat and it, they get it down in the water, but because of the motion, um, it's immediately swamped and it's found uh, two days later on the beach in Oldfield Point by Port Jefferson, half filled with water with people frozen in it. Uh, Manchester has them launch the third smaller lifeboat up that's stored up by the, uh, the pilot house, tells the crew to make sure that it's securely fastened to the side of the steamboat so it doesn't get lost, but either they don't do it properly or it breaks loose and the uh, Manchester puts his coat into it, getting ready to get in and the boat drifts away and uh, gets smashed by the paddle wheel. So now uh, they have, some of them people jump overboard in life jackets and immediately die of hypothermia because the water is below freezing. Uh, Manchester has the passengers and crew, there's about 30 of them with him up on the bow. Uh, they build a raft out of uh, baggage and whatever they can find, put it over the side, but it immediately breaks up and disappears. So um, the only thing pretty much left to save anybody is the cotton bales. So um, Chester Hillier, the 24-year-old captain, uh, testifies that he watched the lifeboats launch unsuccessfully. Uh, and then he's in the midships area with about 20 people. And he says uh, he urges them to stay on board and wait for the boat to stop moving. Otherwise, they're guaranteed to die. Uh, and the people around him listen. So he said uh, after about 20 minutes when the, when the engines died down, uh, he testified that I then recommended to the few deckhands and passengers who remained to throw the cotton overboard. There were perhaps 10 or a dozen bales thrown overboard and they become life rafts. Uh, Hilliard teams up with a fireman named Charles Smith. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, teams up with a fireman named Benjamin Cox. Uh, they put rope around the cotton bale and they push it over the side uh, and they manage not to get wet except for their feet, which have to be in the water to keep the bale from tipping over. And uh, Hillary testified, we placed ourselves uh, one on each end of the bale facing each other. This was about eight o'clock by my watch, which I took out and looked at. It was so cold as to make it necessary for me to exert myself to keep warm, which I did by whipping my hands and arms around my body about four o'clock the bale capsized so they've already been out there at this point for eight hours uh, in this uh, temperature that's down in the minus teens uh, the two of them managed to get back onto the other side of the cotton bale but now they're soaked from head to toe and they're both wearing just street clothes no coats or hats or gloves um, hilliard said they remained uh, shivering on the cotton bale for about two more hours until daylight and then he said of his partner on on the cotton bale for the last half hour that he remained, he had been speechless and seemed to have lost all use of his hands as he did not try to hold on. I rubbed him and beat his flesh and used otherwise every effort I could to keep his blood in circulation. The bale then coming broadside to the sea, it gave a lurch and Cox slipped off and I saw him no more. Uh, David Crowley, the second mate, uh, goes overboard on his own cotton bale, which is good because he never gets wet. He doesn't have to put his feet in the water uh, to keep the bale stable. Um, about midnight, Manchester uh, has urged everybody to stay on board until he thinks the Lexington is about to sink, which he decides about midnight, it, it's time to go. Uh, so he goes over and ends up on a cotton bale with a passenger named Patrick McKenna. And um, they're both drifting away from the steamboat heading, dr drifting east. So uh, a week or two after the disaster, uh, Harper's Weekly runs illustrations of what it would have looked like. So here you see Hillard and his cotton bale with the burning Lexington in the background. Um, and here is Manchester and McKenna on, on his bale of cotton. Uh, Manchester got on dry. Uh, he pulls McKenna out of the water to join him. And he says that, that the testimony uh, at the inquest when I hailed him, uh, hauled him on the bale, I encouraged him and told him to thrash his hands, which he did for a spell, but soon gave up pretty much. When he died, he fell back on the bale and the first wave that came pushed him off it. So uh, Manchester looks at his watch and uh, sees that it's about two o'clock in the morning when the Lexington sinks northwest of Port Jefferson. Now the flames from this burning steamboat going down the sound are seen by people along the shore on, in both Connecticut and Long Island, 
uh, several owners of sailing vessels try to get out to help look for survivors or f look for bodies, uh, but they're blocked because it's low tide and also there's ice built up at the entrance to all their harbors. Uh, the most prominent of these people that tries is a Captain Oliver Meeker uh, from the Sloop Merchant in Southport, Connecticut, and he gets to the mouth of the harbor and can't get over the sandbar and the ice flows, uh, and, but decides to try again in the morning. Uh, there's a captain of a sloop from Brookhaven that's actually out on the sound. Uh, the crew and the captain see the fire burning. Uh, they discuss whether they should try to go help, and the captain decides that they're about four hours uh, of tacking upwind to try to get to where they see the fire and decide that whatever is going to happen uh, will have happened by the, before they could get there and decide not to try and go back into the harbor in Brookhaven, which was their destination. And they're widely condemned afterwards because even though it might have taken them four hours to get there, they could have saved people uh, and uh, probably more than the four people who actually survived. Uh, the most amazing um, rescue is the second mate. But what happens is in uh, early in the, the following morning after the fire, Captain Meeker gets the merchant out of Southport and heads to the scene. Uh, at 11 o'clock, he sees David Hilliard alone on his cotton bale and rescues him. Uh, then about midnight, they, uh, midday, they see Fireman Charles Smith and rescue him. And then, I'm sorry, Manchester is rescued uh, from his cotton bale about noon. And then Fireman Charles Smith, who uh, goes from a cotton bale onto a big piece of the wooden paddle wheel guard, uh, is rescued about 2 p.m. Uh, they look around. They don't see any of the survivors. They pick up three or four bodies uh, and decide to head back to Southport to get treatment for the three survivors they've rescued. Uh, unfortunately, David Crowley, the second mate, is a little further east than the other three. He sees the merchant picking up the survivors, uh, but they don't see him. So they leave him uh, to continue drifting east. Uh, at one point uh, the next day, he's very close to the Connecticut shore and he tries to paddle there with a stick that he had picked up, but the current changes and drives him back out into the middle of the sound. Later, he's near Faulkner Island off the Connecticut shore tries to paddle there, but again, the current changes and he gets driven back out into the middle of the sound. So he ends up drifting 50 hours. Think about that, 50 hours, no hat or coat, no water, no food in his street clothes uh, for more than two days, uh, and then finally washes up on the Riverhead shore in Baiting Hollow. Uh, he then has to climb over giant mountains of ice that have built up. Uh, and to finally get to the beach. And then he looks up and down uh, and luckily sees three quarters of a mile down the beach, a house owned by Matthias and Mary Hutchinson and the lights are on. So he crawls or stumbles that three quarters of a mile. And then uh, Mary Hutchinson describes what happens. She said there was a feeble knock at the kitchen door followed by a faint cry of distress. On opening the door, we discovered the prostate figure of a young man. We instantly carried him into the house in an insensible condition and then saw his hands and arms resembled marble. They were solidly frozen as his feet proved to be once we had cut off his boots. We immediately removed him to a cold room and immersed his extremities in cold water. During the night, we cautiously raised the temperature of the water and before morning, the poor fellow had revived sufficiently to drink a few spoonfuls of beef tea and to articulate a few words. He then made known to us the startling intelligence that a popular steamboat flying between New York and Stonington had been burned to the water's edge. The first request that Mr. Crowley made the next day was the bale of cotton might be secured as a souvenir of the imminent perils for which he had passed. This was done. So this is a, a pretty amazing story. The Hutchinsons typically would have been asleep by 9 p.m. because they were older but their son was visiting. So they stayed up uh, to talk to him and then do prayers together before they went to sleep. Otherwise they would not have heard the knock at the door and Crowley certainly would not have survived yet another night out in the, in the outdoors. Uh, he's also lucky because the Hutchinsons knew how to treat frostbite because if they'd warmed his arms and legs too quickly, he would have, uh, the flesh would have died and turned gangrene uh, and he would have had amputations. But as it was, uh, he kept all of his fingers and toes, but he was so uh, injured by his exposure that he had to stay with the Hutchinsons for nine months before he could go home to Providence. 
But when he goes, he takes the cotton bale with him, uh, keeps it until the Civil War when the lack of cotton coming up from the South drives the price of cotton up to $400 per bale or about $9,000 in today's money. So he sells it so it can be made into, into cloth and turn into uniforms for Union soldiers. So when the, the merchant brings the three survivors into Southport, the word travels up and down the Connecticut coast, gets to Bridgeport where the daily newspapers uh, print extra editions uh, late on Tuesday. Uh, it takes another day for the word to get by steamboat and telegraph into New York and the daily papers there start printing extra editions. Uh, it's a huge story which, which may, um, you know much interest. People wanna know what happened. They wanna blame somebody, particularly the steamboat company and the surviving uh, crew of the Lexington. So the uh, <clears throat> the big paper in New York is the New York Sun, and they want to have coverage that surpasses their less circulating uh, competitors. So um, they they do an extra edition the first afternoon on uh, which would be Wednesday, uh, and they have a small woodcut of a steam a generic steamboat because the technology did not allow. Uh, rapid reproduction of an image so that they could throw something together uh, if they had it like a, a standard uh, image like a steamboat. But if uh, the Sun editors wanted to put a specific Im image of the Lexington on fire, and they knew that would take a while. Uh, but they also know about Nathaniel Courier. Uh, uh, this is an interesting sidelight. When they res rescue Manchester, uh, he has this uh, book from Samuel Taylor Coleridge in his pocket which is waterlogged, but he gives it to the pastor who takes him in in Southport and it's handed down through the family and eventually donated to the uh, to the library uh, in Southport where it's part of the collection. So this is Nathaniel Courier in middle age. Uh, in 1840, he's a young entrepreneur in his twenties, uh, just establishing his business in New York. And he has specialized in disasters, fires in New York, a shipwreck of the uh, the Mexico off the Long Island coast five years before. So he's got a sort of a local reputation for doing uh, lithographs and doing disaster lithographs. So the editors of the Sun approach him and say, how quickly can you give us an image of this burning steamboat to run with our extra editions? Um, it's not clear this from the next day they start running burning Lexington images. It's not clear if they're from if they're initially from Courier or some other artist but every day they get better. And by the 10th day of doing this, uh, they're actually signed by Courier uh, and they're much more sophisticated than the other ones. And this is the final image. Uh, originally it's in black and white. And then uh, they start to add color because uh, Courier has a team of women who will each col uh, do one, add one color on each individual page uh, with a colored crayon and then pass it down to the next person. Uh, and then there, uh, the Sun would print uh, the bottom type initially about the search for survivors and then more details of that uh, effort. And then eventually when the inquest starts a week later, they start to print testimony from the inquest. Uh, they would take the half printed page back to Courier. He would print the lithograph on top and then they would take them back to the Sun. And they did this for uh, several weeks ultimately selling 11,000 extra copies. People were lining up around the block uh, trying to get copies from the Sun because people just couldn't get enough information about the Lexington fire. Uh, after uh, after several weeks of selling them, when the demand started to drop, uh, they stopped doing the extras, but Courier starts printing his own versions on heavier paper, uh, which uh, sell for 11 months, sell thousands more copies. Uh, he's not the only lithographer trying to cash in on the, on the disaster. All of his competitors beyond the U.S. start to do their own versions, and I'll show you a few, none of which are half as dramatic or as accurate as the Lexington by Courier. Uh, because it's an international story, there's actually two uh, lithographs produced in France, and this is one of them, and you can see the type below is, is in French. Uh, this is kind of very impressionistic one. It reminds me of a Joseph Mallard Turner uh, painting. So uh, people want to know how the disaster came about. So the coroner in New York uh, forms an inquest uh, jury a week after the sinking. Uh, he impanels 12 men, no women, uh, and interestingly, uh, all of them are not 
have no maritime experience or maritime connection whatsoever, which will color, color greatly what they uh, come out with on the ninth day as their verdict. So when you read the full testimony, uh, the eight days of testimony start out with Vanderbilt about building Lexington. Uh, his nephew, the shipbuilder, testifies. The two federal steamboat inspectors who inspected the Lexington right before the last voyage testify. Uh, three of the four survivors testify. Experts from the, uh, the foundry talk about the steam engine. Uh, there's a whole series of people who have knowledge of what happened and of the Lexington and of steamboat travel, burning coal versus wood. Uh, and when you read the testimony, almost everybody testifies that the Lexington was well designed, well built, well maintained, properly inspected. Carrying cotton as a cargo was not a problem because uh, bales of cotton that are compacted do not burn easily. Uh, they testify that burning uh, the steam engine was was properly built, properly installed, properly protected against fire, and that burning coal was actually safer than burning wood. Um, Despite this, on the with the jury verdict, uh, the uh, they condemn pretty much everything. They condemn. They say the boat was not safe. Boat was not inspected properly. Burning cotton is dangerous. The uh, burning uh, coal in the steam engine is dangerous. Uh, they blame the crew. They said if they uh, they didn't follow, they weren't disciplined enough. If the crew had done everything properly, they could have rescued everybody on board. Uh, and we know that right off the fact they couldn't have done that because there's only capacity for a third of the people on board in the lifeboats. Um, it, they go on and on. And basically, it's a kangaroo court. They just condemn everything, blame, every, you know, the, they say the uh, the uh, steamboat owners and the crew that survived should be prosecuted. Um, and uh, they go on and on. So the coroner, uh, the, there's two versions of the inquest testimony. The commercial version, uh, based on excerpts of what the newspapers were writing, printed in, in Providence. Uh, here's the cover, and this is the title page. And I love the fact that the title of the pamphlet goes all the way down past the midpoint on the page. Uh, they have their own illustration of the Lexington on fire. Uh, they also include uh, the, the coroner's determination of who was on board. There's 143 names or job titles. So that carries through down into history that there were 143 people on board. Uh, but in my research, I came up with up to 150 names or job titles. Uh, and there could be some duplication there, but uh, we'll never know how many people are on board because the crew list was maintained by the company, but they didn't take the names of any of the passengers. So, uh, <clears throat> what's interesting is this, you know, this basically picks up the uh, the highlights of the testimony uh, as reported in newspapers, the coroner has, uh, and, and the coroner's actual printing was, was very little known, wasn't seen by most people. So most people only read the excerpts, uh, but even then the, the jury didn't follow what the evidence that was, was presented. Uh, but the coroner, uh, after reading, after getting the jury's verdict, puts his own postscript saying, I basically, I don't know about my jury, but as far as I'm concerned, uh, the evidence didn't show where the fire started because the jury says the fire started in the smokestack, which is probably impossible because it was a solid uh, cast iron pipe. Uh, and then there's a 12 inch space out to a wooden outer casing. <clears throat> and the, it was, the boat was designed to have that space filled with hot steam and the moist wet steam would prevent the spread of fire. So flames would typically come out of the top of the smokestack, but they couldn't catch the smokestack on fire because of that design. But despite hearing testimony about the design and the safety of it, the jury decided that the fire started at the smokestack where it was first seen, but the fire was likely started down by the engine or the cook stove or some of the lighting lamps, uh, which were caused by oil. So any of them could have been the cause of the fire. The coroner says it's not apparent to him where the fire actually started. He also includes a lot of letters that had been printed in the newspaper by nautical experts as, as Navy admiral, shipping ex executives, ship captains, basically tearing the jury apart, uh, saying none of you have any maritime experience. You don't know anything about steamboats. Um, and basically going back to the jury testimony and their own experience saying how safe the Lexington was and how properly it was uh, operated and how the crew did everything they could to save people. 
So uh, the despite all of this, the newspapers are writing editorials saying uh, the, 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 so the the owners and the, and the surviving crew should be indicted for murder. The Morning Herald in New York writes that, quote, justice must be satisfied. They must be made to suffer. Uh, but there was no criminal prosecution because pre presumably the prosecutors actually read the full uh, inquest results and realized that there was nobody to indict because everything had been done properly. Uh, interesting enough, there is no litigation by the uh, survivors of the people who died because the, the law at that time did not allow relatives of someone who died to sue for damages. The only people who could sue were the survivors, and they didn't sue because three of them worked for the company and knew the company had done everything properly. And Chester Hilliard, the one passenger who witnessed everything, knew that the company did everything properly, so he wasn't going to sue them either. There were lawsuits for lost property. Uh, under the law of the time, uh, you could sue uh, for damages only if you could prove negligence. Uh, and the company settled a lot of small lawsuits, uh, one passenger suit for loss of three suits. Um, so th some of the small suits were settled you know, in court uh, fairly quickly. Uh, the major lawsuit was the bank, uh, the Merchants Bank in Boston, which had lost $25,000 worth of gold and silver coins. Uh, their lawsuit goes all the way to the Supreme Court. It takes eight years. And then the justices rule uh, overturned the historical precedence, which was that a common carrier like a steamboat was not rely responsible for damages caused by an act of God, but the justices reflecting the jury verdict say that the the, uh, the owners and the crew were negligent and then reverse um, hundreds of years of legal precedent and say that the steamboat company must pay the bank, uh, which they do. Uh, because of all the bad exposure, even though cotton is safe and cotton saved three of the four survivors, uh, actually all four because one of them transferred from cotton to the paddle wheel. Uh, because of this outcry and the bad publicity, the uh, steamboat company stops carrying cotton on its boats. But the, um, the besides the, um, uh, the lawsuits, there's also efforts to salvage uh, the cargo from the Lexington. Uh, but what's interesting is um, all four uh, of the survivors go back to work at sea. Uh, Hilliard goes back to New Orleans and ships out again as a captain. Uh, Cr uh, Crowley, Smith, the fireman, and Manchester, the pilot, all go back to work for the company, and they're all promoted. Uh, so Crowley and Manchester get promoted to full captain. Charles Smith is promoted from fireman to chief engineer. And uh, Crowley and uh, Smith actually serve together on uh, as chief engineer and captain of company steamboats. And in fact, in 1866, their steamboat uh, rescues people from a sinking other steamboat that was in a collision off of Huntington. Uh, so there's a whole lot, lot of publicity about these people for the rest of their careers, particularly when they, so they uh, help these other folks. Um, so Crowley becomes a very respected captain on the sound. Uh, he's also famous because he survived this ordeal of 50 hours on his cotton bale. Uh, so he's prominent. People want to sail on his boat because, A, he's famous, but he's also got a reputation of running a very good boat very safely. He's also a very uh, hospitable captain. He, you know, he mingles with the crew and passengers uh, and, you know, people just like him, uh, but they want to, he's a celebrity. They want to be on his boat. Uh, he does well enough that uh, 12 years after the disaster, he has the two most prominent artists in Providence paint this uh, really exquisite portrait of him. Uh, what's really interesting, and I can't point to it, but if you look down in the lower right corner, he has them include an image of the burning steamboat. And down on the lower left corner, there's an image of him sitting on his cotton bale. So the Lexington is still prominent in his mind. And uh, But uh, he's pretty much uh, emotionally scarred by this whole example, this whole disaster. Uh, when there's, every time there's a, a round year anniversary of the Lexington, the newspapers do anniversary stories. Uh, Crowley will never talk about his experience. Um, he's cordial with everybody, but he, when anybody asks about the Lexington, he just walks away. Uh, Charles Smith, the fireman, on the other hand, is sort of the badge of honor for him. Uh, on anniversaries, he'll talk to the newspapers, he'll go to the newspaper and let them sketch him. Uh, this one's from 19, uh, 1895. Um, he eventually starts working for uh, as an engineer at a power plant uh, in, in uh, Providence. Uh, both of them live uh, to uh, 
to a ripe age. Uh, Crowley dies in 1900, Smith lives to 1905. Uh, six of them, including Smith, six people, including Smith, Crowley, uh, Captain Child, the captain who dies, and three others associated with the wreck, uh, the, the chief clerk, uh, and others are buried in the North Burial Ground in Providence, which is the city's oldest cemetery. And uh, I went up there to take pictures for the book of the graves uh, and found David Crowley's headstone broken in three pieces lying on the ground, uh, which I found to be fairly depressing. And I'm actually trying to put together a fundraising campaign to raise the $2,000 it will take to repair the, the tombstone and, and re-erect it. So if you're interested in helping with that, you can email me at billblier at gmail.com. I will tell you how to do that. Uh, equally depressing is uh, I'm getting newspapers accounts uh, from the uh, Rhode Island Historical Society, uh, including his obituary. And it said he spent his last years in a hospital and then the curator said, you may not realize that, but that hospital was for people who had gone insane. So apparently the emotional toll of his survival uh, ultimately drove him mad. So it was pretty depressing how he ended up, which is why I think you know, his tombstone at least should be in one piece. Uh, but the others are buried up there. Some, uh, this is Charles Smith's uh, uh, memorial, which is fared better than Crowley's had. Uh, this is Chester Hilliard's grave, which is in Yantic, Connecticut, because he lived in Connecticut. And you notice uh, all of them, uh, pretty much anybody, uh, there's 31 uh, either uh, headstones at a grave or more of the markers in the cemetery if the body was never recovered, because only 15 of the bodies were, were ultimately found. Uh, but whether they, there's a body below the, the stone or not, they pretty much always mention the, the Lexington. The most interesting of all these is the, the chief engineer, Cortland Hempstead, who lived in Brooklyn. Uh, he's buried in Greenwood Cemetery. And not only does it mention his death on the Lexington, but there's actually a, you know, a, an engraving of the steamboat on fire on the top of the, cemet uh, the stone. So I mentioned uh, because of the, particularly because of the gold and silver coins, but other valuables, uh, there's multiple salvage attempts to bring up cargo and valuables from the Lexington starting a month or two after the sinking. Uh, there's a, Hart, a Herndon Express Company, which is sort of the FedEx of its era that was transporting the gold and silver for the bank. Uh, so they commissioned salvage uh, crews to go out and try to bring up uh, particularly the gold and silver, but anything else of, of value. And they would have worked in sort of, as you see in this illustration, they would have gone out, found the wreck site, drop the diving bell, which you can see there to the right of the cannons that they're bringing up. And then to the right of that, you see a diver in a hard hat diving suit. So they'd go down in the diving bell, uh, with, which has air in it, and then get to the bottom, step out, and then look around the wreck, and then come back up later in the diving bell. Uh, so uh, there's multiple attempts. Uh, they bring up, uh, in 1842, they bring up some lumps of multiple silver coins. Uh, they also, in 1842, bring up an 18-foot section of the hull, which they bring into New York and display down at the Battery, and people pay 50 cents to see or touch a piece of the Lexington. Uh, in 1843, Mark Davis of Newark uh, goes out using this diving bell, uh, which he uses in several attempts up through 1850. Uh, the diving bell is maintained and kept in his family and then eventually donated to the town where he lived in New Jersey, where you can see it out in the public square by the library. So uh, there's the great outcry uh, from the disaster, in, which is exacerbated by the, uh, the jury inquest verdict. Uh, so uh, later that same year in 1840, Samuel, San Senator Daniel Webster in Congress introduces amendments to beef up the 1838 Steamboat Safety Act, uh, and it doesn't pass. And every year, right up until 1852, there's legislation introduced to toughen the steamboat standards, but Congress doesn't pass the bill because they're not sure they have the legal authority to further regulate interstate commerce. So finally, by 1852, there's been several Supreme Court decisions that bolster their authority, and then they pass a law upgrading everything. There's more inspections required, better safety gear, um, more regulations for carrying cotton. Uh, they toughen the whole thing up and then they do it again in 1871 uh, to make it even more stringent regulation. But uh, 
basically after 1850, the Lexington is left to its own devices on the bottom of Long Island Sound. Uh, nobody goes back out there until uh, 1982 uh, because of Kai Kustler, the adventure author, who in his spare time likes to go find historic shipwrecks, which he's done with great success. So in, in 82, he decides he wants to find the Lexington. He hires researchers to go through all the newspapers and other records, uh, determines where it's likely located, hires a dive boat and captain and crew to go out with side scan sonar uh, to look for the wreck. Uh, and uh, they know it's somewhere northwest of Port Jefferson, uh, southwest of the Stratfordshire Lighthouse. So they go out and within an hour they find the wreck. So uh, Kutzler, for whatever reason, decides not to put divers on the wreck that year, but to come back the next season and, and get people down to retrieve some wreckage to prove that it is the Lexington. So uh, the following summer, he comes to New York with a dive crew of three divers. Uh, the newspapers uh, write about it and uh, a local diver named Robert Wass from Smithtown, who's a commercial diver and owner of a dive shop down in Bayshore, uh, reads about it, tracks down Kustler to his hotel, gets Kustler on the phone and says, you want me on your expedition? I'm a commercial diver. I'm used to the conditions of Long Island Sound, which are terrible, bad visibility, current, a lot of allergy. Uh, and I have all the equipment you could possibly need to do this safely. And Kustler blows them off, says, oh, I got my team. We're, you know, we can, we're all we're set. But the more questions was asked, the answers are more and more dissatisfying and he won't give up. So finally Kustler says, okay, meet my divers tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. in Port Jefferson which he does, Wass gets out there and his suspicions are proven. The divers are basically recreational divers with amateur equipment. And Wass says to them, I don't think you're gonna make it down 140 feet in bad visibility and current. I will go down with you. I'll take some pictures of you. Uh, and then if you have trouble, you're on your own. Uh, and it turns out he's right. The three of them can't get anywhere near the Lexington and have to go back to the boat. So Watts gets down 140 feet to the Lexington by himself. Uh, this is what it would have looked like. And these are commercial dive lights where it's as bright as you can get. And you can see the visibility is maybe a foot or two. And you can see a little bit of wreckage on the left and right of the lights. Uh, he's down there for an hour, comes back up uh, with this piece of, of burned timber. Uh, Hustler has it taken to the Woods Hole Lab in Massachusetts and they test date it and determined the wood is from the uh, 1830s, which means it's pretty clear that he's found the Lexington. Uh, Wass also comes up with some smaller pieces of wood and the metal fitting, uh, all of which is donated to the Vanderbilt Museum and then Centerport. Uh, Watts, uh, this is what he looks like now, uh, goes back out there a few times in his own, comes back with another piece of wreckage that's even more impressive, which is in his living room. Uh, so after he goes out there, the uh, hardcore, you know, experienced wreck divers, because this is well beyond recreational limits, uh, will visit the, the Lexington periodically and try to get some good visual images. Uh, the problem is on a good day, you might see three or four feet. On a bad day, you might see six inches. Uh, so the pictures don't really give you much of an Im Im image of what the Lexington looks like. Um, this is uh, John Beninati from Connecticut on his way down the anchor line. Uh, and the visibility is much better halfway down than it is at the bottom. Uh, down at the bottom, he has a couple of pictures of uh, wooden wreckage. And you can see a lot of marine growth has, uh, has developed. Uh, this is not a donut. This would have been the base for one of the masts. So people you know, like me want to know what, what exactly the Lexington looks like as a shipwreck. Uh, and the photographs obviously don't give you much to work with. So uh, in... Uh, Three years ago, uh, I, I met a gentleman who uh, likes to do side scan sonar. I uh, did some Newsday stories with him. Uh, his, this is Ben Roberts from of Amagansett, now living in Virginia. Uh, and he had a professional side scan equipment on his boat as a sideline. So his plan was to side scan every wreck in the New York metropolitan area, which he has now actually done. Um, but I, I persuaded him to move the Lexington up on his list. So he went out in uh, May of 2020, spent a half day out uh, by the lighthouse. And you can see where he finds the paddle wheel and the bow and the stern. Now in the 1842 salvage, they actually brought the Lexington up to the surface by putting two, co uh, two copper uh, and iron cables around it 
but because it was fire damaged and only supported in two places, it broke in half in the middle. One of the paddle wheels fell off and the four pieces sank back to the bottom. Uh, so uh, when Ben Roberts goes out there, he finds one paddle wheel. There's no trace of the other one because it probably disintegrated or just sank deeply into the mud. Uh, but because they drifted back down in separate pieces, they're pretty widely scattered. Uh, and you can see this is on a regular map, and this is what they look like on a nautical chart. Uh, you can see the light. Oops, you can see the lighthouse uh, uh, just sort of north uh, east of the wreckage. So this is what the battle looks like with using uh, sound waves to, to make a picture. And you can very clearly see the structure is that lattice work boxes that that. Uh, Vanderbilt used to design the Lexington. So here's the bow, uh, here's the stern, uh, and here uh, Ben made a composite showing the bow and the stern lined up with the original image so you can see how they stack up. And uh, this is the one paddle wheel. Uh, it seems to be vertical in the, in the muck on the bottom. So it, when it sank, it probably dropped uh, right standing vertically and, and stunk, it stuck itself into the mud because uh, the profile looks like you're looking top down. And as I said, the, the other one is MIA. So uh, I'm actually trying to get out there with a lot of these people in October to see if we can get better stills and video. But for the time being, this is the best view people can have of the Lexington. This was great. Thank you, Bill. Um, yeah, let's see. I'll pull up our Q&As and we'll see what kind of questions we have going on. We'll see. So here I have um, the first question that we have is, um, would you please show again the opening map? Uh, is the name Devil's Belt related to uh, Sputin Devil or the folktale the Devil Throwing Rocks at Connecticut? Um, basically, uh, the Devil's Belt was uh, a sort of bastardized English translation of, of what the Dutch would have called Long Island Sound. Uh, and it was, had nothing to do with devils or anything like that. It, it was just translated into English and kind of corrupted. Um, so that's the short answer. Okay. Um, and then uh, how common were such steamboat disasters in the mid 19th century? Um, there were plenty of steam, I'm trying to get rid of the share, but I guess it doesn't matter. The, um, there, were, there were very frequent steamboat disasters. There weren't that many fires. Uh, the uh, the Lexington actually had a small fire uh, a couple of weeks before the final voyage. Uh, the somehow the uh, they were doing repairs on the deck and uh, some of the deck planking caught on fire. And then they also had there were there was another earlier fire where uh, a lamp in one of the, in one of the cabin crew's cabins caught on fire, but they put it out right away. So fires were pretty rare. What the bigger problem was with boil explosions, particularly in the early years you know, in the 1820s, 1830s, but all the way up through the Civil War, because uh, often what would happen is they, the, the captains and crew would race to, you know, to, to have bragging rights, or they would overload uh, the, the uh, cargo or crew or passengers, uh, or they would, uh, the steam escape valves would be tied open so they could go faster, uh, or just they didn't maintain the boilers properly and, and they would, a weakness would develop in the iron and they would blow up. Uh, the most famous of the, uh, and they, they were happening all the time, particularly in Midwestern and Western rivers. The most famous was the Sultana in 1865, traveling north on the Mississippi, carrying about 2,000 uh, Union prisoners who had been released from the Andersonville prison in Georgia. The boat was old, not maintained well, and was heavily overloaded. So they're coming up the Mississippi River near Memphis, and the boilers exploded. Uh, and almost everybody on board died. It was uh, it was uh, about two thousand dead people from that one accident. Uh, but you know the fires were rare and got rarer uh, over time because the fire safety equipment got better, and and the boiler you know the boil explosions the boils got better too with more inspections and you know higher specs. So it um, after the Civil War they that you know those kind of disasters pretty much fall away. But you still have a lot of collisions and bad weather you know, that claim a lot of lives. And so with this fire in particular, like you said, I believe in the talk, they never really figured out exactly how or why the fire occurred, right? There was some speculation, but there was never any real confirmation. Yeah, I mean, the official jury verdict was it started, uh, you know, on, uh, you know, in the smokestack, around the smokestack. Um, and as I said, the design of the steamboat and physics don't lead to that conclusion. It was probably either, the, uh, you know, a, a loose coal from 
uh, or seam, you know, opened up in the in the in the boilers or a coal, you know, a cook stove fire uh, or a lamp fire. But they took a lot of precautions. They had iron plating installed over the steam engines and over the furnaces uh, in case the flame, you know, started burning up. They had big pans of water underneath the steam engines in case the coals dropped on the on the on the deck. Uh, when they emptied out the the burning coals, they went right into a 12 inch diameter pipe that went down through the through the hull into the water. Um, so it's you know it's really hard to say, um, and nobody will ever know. And so, um, how many bodies were recovered? Did you say? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, 15, uh, 10 percent, 15 bodies were recovered, plus the four survivors. Uh, and that was it. Uh, you know, the, because the water was so cold and they're wearing whatever you know, clothing would get waterlogged and they would, uh, people tend to sink in cold water and float in hot water, hotter water. So, the, you know, the water temperature was probably about 10 or 20 degrees. So most of the bodies were never found. The ones that they did find, uh, some of them were on wreckage. Uh, that they found that the uh, merchant uh, recovered that you know in the second day uh, all the rest washed up on the long island shore from oldfield point uh, east out towards riverhead and they found you know some of them washed up you know for days or weeks after the uh, after the fire and then um we have someone here they don't say what museum they're from but they say uh that we have a copy of a letter in our museum that mentions the lexington disaster in particular, the loss of Henry Finn. Uh, I can send you a copy if you wish. I would like that. If you can uh, email to billblier at gmail.com, I would like to have that for my files. Sure. Yeah, they, oh, they said uh, historic Sandusky in uh, Lynchburg, Virginia. That's where they're from? Yeah, I believe so, oh. yeah. OK, uh, interesting. Uh, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of letters out there. I mean, this was a huge story, so people were talking about it. Particularly, if you uh, knew somebody who was on board, the uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the famous poet, was uh, in the initial newspaper story said he was on board. Uh, then later stories, which have been repeated by other authors up to the present, said that he was supposed to be on board, but he didn't. Get, he missed the boat because he was meeting with his editor. Uh, going over the his new poem, The Wreck of the Hesperus, uh, and that's been re repeated all over the place. Uh, but I decided to dig a little deeper, and uh, his Wadsworth uh, Longfellow's letters have been published, so I got the volumes from 1840. Turns out he was already back in Cambridge after doing a speaking tour in New York before the Lexing uh, several days before the Lexington left, um, and then he writes about it to his father a couple days later, the, you know, talking about the accident reflecting the hysteria saying, you know, he, he's heard that the boat wasn't run safe, the boat wasn't safe, it wasn't run properly. Uh, and he laments the loss of Charles Fallon, the Hofstra, uh, the Harvard professor who he apparently knew. Uh, but, the, you know, this this is kind of the legend that goes up, you know, where people are repeating misinformation. Uh, uh, you know, that, that was my big find in doing my research was that Longfellow, you know, never intended to be on the Lexington. So that was kind of interesting to see that. But uh, you see a lot, a lot of letters. Uh, you know, people writing letters offering rewards for the return of bodies of relatives. Uh, you know, anybody writing a letter to anybody you know, around that period, you know, friends or whatever, you know, is talking about the Lexington because it was huge, you know, a huge big deal. Um, and then the uh, the last question we have here um, was somebody asking, uh, can we email for personalized copies of your book? Which I believe, yes, you said, correct? Yes, right? um, I would be happy to uh, email me. I'll give you the details, uh, you know, what it would cost. You can tell me if you want to sign what kind of inscription you'd like, and I will get them right out to you. Uh, the other thing is, if you, uh, I have a uh, a Facebook page called Bill Blyer History Lectures, where I list all of my 10 lectures and where I'm giving them. Uh, and I also have an email list where I can put you on that if you want to know about my other lectures, some of which I've done for uh, for Connor. Um, so, if, you know, that or any questions, comments, um, or buying a book that you, you, know, you can buy it all over, but if you want it signed or inscribed, you have to get that from me. So, uh, billblier at uh, gmail.com is the way to go. And for anybody watching us live right now, um, I put it in the chat uh, below. So, if you wanted to grab that, copy and paste it quickly, you can. Anybody watching later, I'll make sure to include that in the YouTube uh, description. So people can grab it to email you. Um, and selfishly, I would say uh, you can stop by the Southampton History Museum and come to our gift shop. We have uh, several copies of the book for sale here. So if you'd like to support Bill and the museum, you can come by and 
come by here and get it uh, a copy yourself. Yeah, um, we should we should also mention that I'm doing a lecture out there in person uh, August third about uh, smuggling pirates and rum runners. So uh, you may want to put that on your calendar. Exactly. Yes, that's actually listed on our website right now. So if you RSVP on our website today, uh, you'll you can join us in August for that talk. Um, and without any further uh, questions, um, I want to thank you, Bill, for joining us today and everybody that joined us here on today's talk. Uh, this was really fascinating. The whole time I was listening to it, I was thinking that this would make like a really great little movie or something like that. Uh, I could see it perfectly on, on a history channel. It's like a nice two part or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it would be it, it, it would be it's it's it, it, it would be a great thing. It's it's hard to get documentaries made because I've tried on of some of my books and uh, haven't got haven't made it yet. But you never know. You never know. So yeah, but but thank you everybody for joining us today. And uh, make sure to sign up for website on our mailing list. You can join us in some of our future programs. And we will see you all next time. Thanks. Great. Thanks everybody.